My title tonight then comes from Professor Bob Marley. Uh, you'll find <laughs> you'll find it on the Exodus album if you're wanting to go looking on Spotify. Stir it up. Um, but it's inspired by a phrase in the Westminster Directory of Worship, 1645, which may not have been particularly important in your tradition, but was very important in my tradition. For those of you who don't know your Westminster standards, the Westminster Assemblies were he gatherings held in Westminster, England, during the Long Parliament during the English Civil War in the 17th century. The Union of the Crowns of England and Scotland had already taken place in 1603, but Scotland and England were still at that point independent nations with their own sovereign parliaments. Lord, bring the day to pass. <laughs> In England, <laughs> those on the more Puritan or Calvinist side of the theological and ecclesiastical divide dreamt of a final push to properly reform the Church of England. Sadly, it never happened. They shared some common cause with Scottish Presbyterians, and for some at least, there was a dream of a properly reformed church. They used to say that the, the Church of England was but partially reformed. They dreamed of a properly reformed church which would encompass both England and Scotland in an unbroken fellowship, polity, theology, and spirituality. And the Westminster Assembly of Divines was the council, the conciliar instrument adopted to devise a manifesto or a series of manifestos for that further revolution. It's one of the ironies of history um, that it had far more influence in Scotland and through the Church of Scotland on the uh, the, the global church than it ever did actually in England. <clears throat> now those who gathered were therefore broadly inheritors of a Calvinist tradition in theology, even if they had some disagreements about church government. Uh, most of those who gathered would have been congregationalists or independents, uh, and they were joined by a few Scots who were Presbyterians. They were fairly close when it came to thinking about worship and liturgy. And they, rec they, they represented the tra trajectory of Reformation Protestantism, which has been charted by Brian Spinks and Alan Sell. And I just discovered today that Alan Sell was Anna's doctoral supervisor, which I didn't know. And their description of what Spinks calls the antipathy to set liturgical forms in the English-speaking Reformed tradition. <clears throat> Now, this antipathy, this opposition, this hostility to set liturgical forms is, in my view, often not given enough significance within church history or liturgical studies. But as Baptists will know only too well, it has been one of the most powerful forces and dynamics shaping worship practice and spirituality across the broad family of Protestant traditions, both those which came like uh, my tradition from the Magisterial Reformation and those which came more from the Radical Reformation, the Baptist, Anabaptist end of the spectrum. It overlaps with what we might call the pietist left wing of Lutheran tradition and the Puritan left wing of Anglican tradition. It dominates the English and the Scottish Congregationalist and Presbyterian Reformed traditions almost entirely for two centuries from the 1640s through to the 1840s. And I would say it reigns almost unchallenged within Baptist practice, not to mention its distinctive accents among Quakers and Shakers. It was characteristic of the spirituality of the evangelical revivals and the Great Awakenings. It had a major influence on Methodism from the beginning. It animated the Brethren movement. It was given a distinctive incarnation within African American and Caribbean churches, which emerged out of the trauma and the evil of slavery. And it's also an animating and structuring feature in the rise of Pentecostalism from its beginnings. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the hostility to any kind of idea that the content of worship should be written down. And the key text here in the Bible was that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I'm getting an amen corner over here. Um, uh, so there was this hostility to this idea. 
Spinks characterises it negatively as an antipathy, and that's definitely one side of the coin. But what he and Alan Sell also point out is that the antipathy is driven positively by a set of assumptions about how the work of the Holy Spirit is manifest in the life of Christian communities. What should be read in worship within this view is the scripture and only the scripture. Everything else should, as far as possible, be extempore and spontaneous. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Any corrupt and unspiritual man can read aloud a liturgy from a book. It takes someone animated by the living spirit of God, they believed, to pray and preach from within using their own words. The Church of Scotland at the Reformation had produced their own book of common order, which was patterned after the Genevan orders, and, uh, which had been encountered by John Knox and others uh, in that most perfect school of Christ that John Calvin ran in Geneva. By the 1640s, however, the mood of the Westminster Assembly had moved beyond even tolerating the idea of a book of common order. And so they settled instead on a directory, which is definitely and deliberately less than a book of common order and much less than a prayer book, especially a prayer book which had to be approved by Parliament. Within the looser rubrics of the directory, you were given limited guidance about the general shape of worship. But in the light of this antipathy, there was no final formal texts. And instead, and this is what caught my attention and what I want to think about with you tonight, the minister is enjoined to lead public prayer in such a way as to stir up suitable affections. Okay, so that's what the Westminster Directory said. You weren't given any set prayers, any formal prayers. You were free to pray as the Spirit in, uh, inspired you to. But you were commissioned to do this. And I found this very interesting, to stir up suitable affections. Now, we noted in the first lecture that history was one of the disciplinary areas being marked by a turn to affect and emotion. And this developing awareness in history of how experiences may be differently constructed in different times and places, that starts with the need to track how language itself changes. It moves in the West from an initial focus on passions uh, through the language of affections, which is what we're hearing here in the 17th century, and then onto sentiment, and then widespread use of the term emotions only begins from the early 19th century. It's also worth noting what Matthew Bolton draws attention to in his 2011 book, Life and God, that in the Calvinist tradition, there was a, uh, an insistence on stressing what the Holy Spirit did in us within worship uh, rather than what we were doing. But given that's the guiding tradition of the Westminster Directory, I think this makes this piece of advice all the more interesting. So in my tradition, uh, when we lead people in prayer, according to this book, we are encouraged and commissioned to stir up suitable affections. And I think this is a crucial insight and one which needs more often to be explicitly formulated and reflected on because it brings with it a certain responsibility for shaping the experience of the worshipping community. And that responsibility is one which I think worship leaders and liturgists and preachers are often strangely reluctant to accept or to acknowledge. <clears throat> I'm going to give you uh, some more of my history. I first became more aware of this reticence in the early 1990s when I was working in Glasgow with a pioneering alternative worship emerging church group called the Late Late Service. We'd been inspired by the original Anglican pioneers, Sheffield's nine o'clock service. And like them, we were deeply influenced by club culture and rave culture. I was a bit younger. This was a, a period which had witnessed the development of increasingly elaborate multimedia club venues, where electronic dance music or chill music was combined with digital visual imagery, and in some cases, elements of contemporary art installations. Uh, there was a heightened attention to decor and environment. And the Late Late Service met later in the evenings, because that was a cultural analog to when our peers went clubbing. And it was also easier to black out venues for visual projection. So venues were hung with fabric screens and sometimes also had monitors positioned within them. The spaces were 
uh, full of visuals. Um, there were different visual sequences appearing on screens in different sides of the room. The music was loud and immersive. When it was led by a live band, they were positioned so that people couldn't turn to face them or gather in front of them. Services often incorporated ritual elements, and they also frequently, frequently contained visual installations, or what we called stations, which people could move to and where they could be involved in some kind of liturgical action. Now, all of these options disrupted the traditional linear structure of worship, whether it was in a high church or a low church format. I don't very often talk about these services in much detail uh, these days. They belong, in a sense, to a, a different era. Um, um, I've written more about them in my book, Remixing the Church, if you're interested in knowing more about them. But I mention them now because of their significance in helping me to reflect on the idea of taking responsibility for the environment of worship and for crafting the rhetoric of worship and shaping the worship experience. Two things were particularly important to me. The first was our own practice of innovation, particularly around visual images and installations and ritual. And because we were operating in new and unfamiliar ways, most of us had come from a very low church evangelical background. We questioned our own assumptions or we knew, no longer knew how to apply the old assumptions to new things. And that made us, I think, reflect theologically on what we were doing. Were these words or these images or these actions and the combination of them, were they a fitting and were they appropriate? Did they do what we wanted them to do and what did we want them to do? The second thing though came, and this is really in a sense what I want to focus on, came in the form of challenges from folk who attended the services. We attracted a lot of tourists, a lot of curious people who wondered what we were up to and came to check us out. And some people took to the format like old hands and they instinctively felt at home or they quickly learned how to inhabit and explore the environment. But others were deeply suspicious and openly hostile and critical. And the most common criticism was not that we were unorthodox because we rarely were, if ever. The most common criticism was that this was manipulative. Now, after hearing that for the first few times and trying to talk to those who made that accusation, I began to realize two things. One was that the, the, the concern was a kind of reflex born out of culture shock and cultural confusion. The other was that those criticizing us had almost no conception of taking responsibility themselves for the visual, musical, or ritual rhetoric of their own worship. They took the familiar for granted in ways that were deeply conservative, but which also, I think, lacked insight into their own behavior and what that meant. So I would have conversations where I tried to get them to own the action of the person playing the pipe organ. So I said, when they pull out all the major stops on the pipe organ, and when they crank up the volume for the final verse, you're moving a lot of air and you're activating a lot of frequencies in that space. When you do that, I would say, that's a pretty manipulative thing to do, don't you think? <laughs> and they would look at me coldly, usually unimpressed. Or if people came from another spectrum of the church, I would say, so we're three worship songs into the opening praise time and the band pulls it right back so there's just a single synth pad washing under the vocals and we go nearly a cappella and we're going within the veil and then they hold that chord at the end of the song and people begin to pray simultaneously in tongues and a passionate hum of glossolalia spreads through the room. That's a pretty strong rhetoric you're operating with there, isn't it? And again, people would look at me and not be impressed. Or when you invite people to come forward at the end of the service for ministry and a few leaders move to stand in a line at the front off to one side and that cues folk in the congregation often in states of emotional distress to come forward and kneel beside them to receive the laying on of hands, to have prayers for healing and deliverance whispered in their ear. That's a pretty powerful ritual you've just enacted, isn't it? Again, people were not impressed by that description of what they were doing but they often didn't really have uh, a very clear alternative way to describe what they were doing. 
Or that stuff we do in crusade evangelism when we sing just as I am and ask folk to come forward and give their lives to Jesus. Powerful emotional rhetoric combined with manipulation of emotion through music and a strongly felt pressure to participate in the ritual. Sometimes I had some good conversations and people got it and they took me on. Um, uh, if, if Stuart's going to have a conversation with you and you throw out a challenge, he goes, let's dance then. Um, and sometimes people did. <laughs> See, some of you have had that. Um, so, and sometimes people said, let's dance. And they had the conversation and, and, and they took it on. Um, but more often I was met with incomprehension. That's not the same thing at all. Uh, that's just the Holy Spirit at work. Uh, that's just the reality of God showing up. Um, it was in response to that, I think, that friends of mine like Mark Pearson and Johnny Baker, who've written on this, began to develop the language of curating worship. Curating worship has a gentler and a less threatening feel to it. It just somehow feels more, we're just carefully crafting an environment um, uh, for this to happen. However, I would say that I am now grateful for those challenges which people brought because they made me reflect on the human action and work of leading worship and the way in which responsibility uh, uh, and, and, and what kind of responsibility we have for our part in shaping that and even manipulating people's emotions. Why people uh, want to go so quickly to that word manipulation and why they're so reluctant uh, to take responsibility for it. I think this is a real problem for anyone who's teaching worship or preaching. The reluctance to admit what you are intending to do with emotions and to accept responsibility for the rhetoric or the strategies you're going to use. I have some students from a charismatic evangelical background and when everything seems to go well and they make a powerful impact or have a strong connection with those who are leading in worship, they'll immediately say, oh, it wasn't me, it was God. Um, to which I respond, well, let's hope and trust that God is in all this alongside us. But since I'm about to work with you on a critique of that sermon <laughs> and, the, and the worship you just presented, God's not to blame for the stuff that needs fixed in it. <laughs> So you can see, I hope, why I fell on that phrase in the Westminster Directory with such relief. Pray in such a way to stir up suitable affections. Because if that's what we're doing, if we could all accept that, uh, then we could begin to have an honest conversation about what we were doing and how we were doing it. Now, so far I've been speaking about liturgy, but the same concerns can be applied to preaching. Karl Barth was famously unhappy about associating preaching with rhetoric. But I think we can give Barth's theological concerns a hearing while still accepting responsibility for the rhetoric of our own preaching. If we recall the classic Aristotelian view of rhetoric, at its simplest that meant that preaching required Logos and pathos and ethos. So there was content aimed at understanding. There was pathos and form, uh, which were aimed at feeling. And then ethos was important. Your perception of the character of the person who was speaking and whether you felt you could trust them. Another way to put that can be found in Sam Wells' adaptation of a motto which has often been used in Steiner schools. Um, so Steiner schools, people often talk about education should have something for the head and something for the heart and something for the hand. And Sam, who was the uh, Dean of Chapel at Duke University, a well-known theologian, is now the Vicar of St. Martin in the Fields, a large Anglican church in London, very prominent uh, theologian in the UK at the moment, um, uh, even though he's working in a, in a, a pastoral setting. And Sam says that preaching should have something for the head, something for the heart, something for the gut, and something for the hand. So he, he adds in an extra layer of uh, where he feels preaching needs to address the things that really matter in people's lives, the things that are viscerally important to them. There are not enough good books out there about using words in worship. 
And my favorite one to date is a little book called Worship Words, which was written by Ron and Deborah Reinstra, who are based in Grand Rapids and was published in 2009. And in that book, there's a small panel by Ron in their chapter on authenticity, and it's a section about preaching, and Ron's given it the title, Feel It With Me Now. And I think he's got the phrasing of that absolutely right. If we followed Tom Long, the uh, theologian of preaching, if we followed his suggestions that sermons should be underpinned by a focus and a function statement, and those of you who've studied with Professor Blythe here uh, may uh, be familiar with that advice, then I wonder whether we could add a third F for feeling. What's the sermon about? What's the sermon doing? Which was the key question that Long inserted there, I think which has been a very fruitful question for preachers. But also, Ron says, what do I want people to feel at different points in the sermon? And his point is made about preaching, but I think it applies at any point in the liturgy. So I want to move on and develop this double point about intentionality and responsibility. In other words, being intentional, being prepared to say, yes, I'm here to stir up suitable affections. I accept that that's part of my responsibility if I'm leading worship. And I'm going to be transparent about it and take responsibility for it. And so we could potentially have a conversation about whether I've done it right and responsibly, as opposed to me pretending that it wasn't me, it was all God who did it. Uh, which actually hides my agency and doesn't make me accountable for what I do. So I want to do this in three ways, develop this point about intentionality and responsibility. Firstly, by saying something about crafting liturgy and public prayer. Secondly, by giving some examples of how ritual confirms emotion in the body. And thirdly, by reflecting very briefly on emotional awareness in sermon preparation. So first of all, I want to talk about crafting liturgy and public prayer. In my own worship practice, there are two insights which I keep close to me at all times when I'm preparing worship. And I want to just share those with you and see what they are. The first comes from Sam Wells, who I've already mentioned, and from an article he wrote, which is called How Common Worship Forms Local Character. And this is a quote from the opening section of the article, which focuses on gathering. Sam says, when Christians gather together to worship, whether two or three or two or three thousand, they are quickly reminded or become aware of three things. And you're only going to get the first one. The first is that they are in the presence of God. The ability to name the presence of God is a skill. It's a skill that the scriptures train the church to perform. The presence of God may be commanding, as for Abraham and Haran, may be troublesome or mysterious as it was for Jacob at Bethel and Peniel, can be echoingly silent as for Elijah on Carmel or awesome as for Isaiah in the temple. It can be perceived amid injustice as for the centurion at the cross or in human companionship as for the disciples on the Emmaus road. By naming the presence of God, the community develop the faculty of wonder. They have their imagination stretched to perceive the greatness of God, the mystery of his deciding to make himself known, and the grace of his means of doing so. They're formed in the virtue of humility. They discover that this God has a purpose for his creation, and they themselves have a valued part to play. And they perceive this story is not about them, but about God. They learn to rest upon the notion of God's inextinguishable glory and unshakable faithfulness. They enter a tradition of providence encompassing Noah's rainbow, Isaac's ram, Moses' pillar of cloud, Hannah's prayer, Daniel's lions, Elizabeth's child, the stilled storm, the great commission, the new Jerusalem. In the presence of God, the congregation learned the skill of alertness, readiness, anticipation, expectation, that the God who has acted will keep his promises and will reveal himself today. Now, I love that quote, and I would say that quote changed my ministry and maybe even changed my life. Uh, and, and I was struck by the fact, I think, that the language he uses uh, is unusual. I was kind of prepared for it because I'd read the theologian Stanley Hauervas. And to insert the word skill there, which is, a, is the unusual word, I think, is something that would be uh, part of Hauervas talking about a kind of craft tradition in which habit and practice are 
important. Um, but the crucial words for me are these, the ability to name the presence of God is a skill that the scriptures train the church to perform. Now, what Wells is pointing to here, I think, is why we need the whole of scripture. This is very much a canonical approach to worship. It draws us into what Walker, Walter Brueggemann calls Israel's passionate dialogue with God. It insists that everywhere throughout the scriptures where we are following that dialogue, that relationship between Israel and Israel's covenant partner, Yahweh, then we are going to be um, learning something about what it means to perceive uh, the presence of God and name the presence of God in very different situations. And sometimes as Israel moves into those situations, they will generate a new title for God because of their experience. Uh, uh, and, and, and we see that throughout uh, the Hebrew Bible, throughout the Old uh, Testament. And so it's a way to adapt Ron's phrase again, almost of seeing uh, the whole of Scripture as saying, feel it with me, uh, or hearing that invitation coming directly from God. And one of the things that that has, has uh, done for me, I think, is given me an enormous sense of anticipation about working with Scripture and opening the Scriptures. Uh, and, and no matter where I'm going, I try to remember what Sam's saying here, that there's something here um, about naming the presence of God in a situation, in a context, um, which I may not have encountered before. And the reason I think for using the language of skill is that uh, when Stanley Hauervas uses this, he talks about the way in which we internalize a set of skills and, and we store them up for situations in which we may need them in the future. And if we have been formed by an encounter with how people perceived God, for example, if we've spent time with Job, um, or if we've spent time thinking about Elijah feeling he was completely defeated, or if we've uh, been uh, living deeply in the Psalms, in all of the Psalms, in all of the difficult uh, and surprising corners of the Psalms, then maybe when we come into places in our lives that we never expected to be in or, or hoped never to be in, then we will have new skills and new resources uh, which we can bring to bear in that moment. And the Holy Spirit will activate, if you like. By skill, I don't think he means this is something which is entirely a human capacity. I think he's also meaning that this is something within a vision of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. If that's the, se the first insight, the second is like it. And in a sense, I think it depends on the first for me. I remember uh, some time ago now, um, because it was during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, visiting a friend there. Derek Poole was the pastor theologian of an independent charismatic Baptist fellowship, and I'd met him uh, at an arts festival in, in Ireland, in the, the south of Ireland. He was a deeply thoughtful person, politically committed, artistically sensitive, and he said something to me that I've never forgotten. He said, um, during the Troubles, when there had been a bombing or a shooting near to where his church uh, was based, that they would try as a congregation, as many of them as could, to go and to gather as close to where this had happened and to pray together as close as the security services would let them come. And he said to me, when we gather, one of the things we always do is we ask ourselves, what name of God do we cry out in this situation? And that has never left me. Um, I, I grew up in a tradition of prayer that its worst had turned into using uh, Father and Lord as resting beats while you thought about the next part of your prayer. Lord we just, Father we just, uh, and, and uh, there was a rich tradition of naming God which our habits of prayer had almost completely set to one side uh, because the grammar uh, and the habit and the skill of doing something different had kind of disappeared from what we were doing. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Derek's comment uh, pulled me up. Sean, here was this charismatic as well, this charismatic evangelical saying this to me. Um, what name of God do we cry out in this situation? And I've never forgotten that. 
And then when I read Sam's article, the two things came together in my mind. And I would say that I never prepare worship now without those two things in my mind. One is, how are these scriptures I'm working with going to train me in the skill of naming the presence of God? And also, what name of God do we cry out in this situation? And very often, uh, the second decision will be informed by how God is named in the scripture. Uh, and so I always say to students, that's where you start, uh, I think. You start, um, if, if Jesus is being uh, depicted in a certain way in the passage, named or identified with a certain title, well, why not start with that? Because there may not be another morning in which, you know, for, for, for another nine months in which you're working with a scripture where that happens. So why not live into that and lean into that this morning and see what, what you have to learn uh, and understand and feel through using that uh, this morning. So these two insights have become permanently welded together in my worship preparation brain, and they are always with me when I sit down to prepare for worship and when I stand up to lead prayer in church. I want to move on, and I want to say something about ritual and emotion and bodies. So I mentioned last night my admiration for the work of Canadian theologian, philosopher, James K. E. Smith. And I'm going to be drawing on his work both in tonight's lecture and in the lecture tomorrow night. And some of you will know his work, but uh, others may not. So I wanted to give you a brief summary of uh, Jamie's project. Um, uh, these are four of the books um, that he's written. He's written many books, but these are four that I want to uh, uh, bring before you tonight. Um, the most well-known of these is a book called Desiring the Kingdom, which was published in 2009. Um, and then he wrote a sequel to it called Imagining the Kingdom. And then he wrote um, a book about Charles Taylor, an introduction to Charles, Charles Taylor's philosophy um, called How Not to be Secular. And then he did a kind of introductory book, which is a summary, uh, a more accessible summary of Desiring the Kingdom uh, called You Are What You Love. I just want to say a little bit about uh, what Jamie's project is, as I understand it. Um, so he took two classic uh, uh, insights from Christian tradition. And one was from Augustine. And it was a way of understanding, uh, I've called it um, a, an affective anthropology. In other words, a way of understanding, giving account of human beings and how human beings operate and how they work. And Augustine talked about how human behavior, in a sense, was driven, he believed, by what we loved and by what we desired. Uh, and in uh, his Latin work, the term libido, um, uh, in a slightly different sense to the one we usually use it, but not entirely disconnected. Desire and love is a phrase that crops up there. So um, Smith takes an Augustinian anthropology where human beings are shaped by their loves, and he combines that with an, a set of insights which really come initially from the philosopher Aristotle and which are very important in Thomas Aquinas, which is the idea of habits and practices in our lives helping to form us in virtue. So he takes these two things, an Augustinian idea that we're, we're, we're guided by our loves and by our desires, uh, and uh, this insight from Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and that tradition on practices and habits uh, helping to form us in virtue. Now, the key thing to understand um, is what he then does with the word liturgy, because he uses the idea of liturgy to describe this relationship between how practices lead to sh shape our loves, shape the things we love. And it's important to realize that this is not just how he thinks Christians are formed. When he uses the term liturgy, he's not just talking about religious liturgy. He's talking about how the whole of society and culture works. So he would say that liturgical spaces are not just ecclesiastical, they're cultural and social. And his whole project is called the Cultural Liturgies Project. So his liturgical spaces are shopping malls and sports stadiums and classical music concerts and opera houses and rock concerts and commencement ceremonies and graduation ceremonies. And he says these places and what happens to us in them, they work on us socially through our bodies and our senses. They work on our feelings 
uh, and they school us and they, inf they form us in ways which we are often unconscious of. And he thinks that Christian churches and Christian schools and universities have too often misunderstood how people are formed and how they are shaped. He thinks they've been far too focused on ideas or worldviews or the life of the mind. And he uses a phrase, they, they've treated people like brains on sticks. And he thinks they've misunderstood the affective, somatic, bodily dimensions of social and cultural formation. Now, those ideas were already there in his book, Desiring the Kingdom. And what he does in the second book, Imagining the Kingdom, in much greater depth and detail, is he tries to talk about how he thinks this actually happens and works in practice. And he draws in particular on the work of philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty and sociologist and philosopher Pierre Bourdieu. And he argues that we need to think about a liturgical anthropology in terms of what he says is a kinesthetics and a poetics. Um, and what does he mean by that? Well, he says, if the story of the gospel, which he uh, uses the phrase, the true story of the whole world, if such a story is going to capture our imaginations, he says, it needs to get into our gut and it needs to be written on our hearts. And the way to the heart is through the body. So um, this is what he means when he's talking about liturgies and when he's talking about formation. He emphasizes the ways in which liturgical uh, practice and ritual practice give us a kind of feel for the world. Now, again, the danger here is that we, we, that we hear this and we think about churches when we think about rituals. Um, and if we're Baptists or Pentecostals, well, perhaps we think, well, it's other people's churches because we don't have rituals. But that would be a mistake because Smith means all of the secular stuff which is going on around us. So he says, liturgies are formative because and just to the extent that they tap into our imaginative core. He says, the formative power of liturgies is bound up with their aesthetic force. Such liturgies are pedagogies of desire that shape our loves because, and listen to this, they picture the good life for us in ways that resonate with our imaginative nature. Over time, we're formed as a people who desire a certain end, a certain goal in life, because we've been immersed in liturgies that have captured our imagination by aesthetic means. Now, that's quite complex language in some ways, but what he's talking about then, he's talking about walking into the mall and being surrounded by advertising hoardings that begin to associate a certain kind of look uh, with a certain uh, set of outcomes for us. Um, uh, you will... Uh, if, you, if you buy this scent and apply it, uh, you will be much more attractive to women, Doug. Um, if you uh, buy that outfit, um, you will um, uh, feel more powerful and more successful. So that this way in which advertising in particular, this is the native language of advertising, uh, perhaps above all. And to get what he's meaning, I think we do need to think less about religion and more about the rest of our lives. So a better way, in a sense, to get what Smith's on to, I think, would be to think about the car we drive and how we feel about it. Think about the food brands in our fridges and how we feel about them. Think about the clothes we wear. In particular, think about brands that we will uh, uh, buy and that we won't buy. Think about the way we've decorated our houses, the styles of our furniture the brand of our phone, to Apple or not to Apple. Or think about the way we behave in certain spaces like sports grounds or nightclubs. To adapt the saying of Jesus, we start with where our treasure is and we ask how our heart got there. So that it is our treasure. We are what we love, Smith says. So let's trace how we learn to love things. And in particular, he wants us to think about how our bodies have been involved in training our loves. Imagining the Kingdom, the second book where he drills down into this, is a demanding uh, read. Um, I emailed him and I said, I'm guessing 10% of the people who read your first book bought and read this one. And he said, yeah, that's about right. Um, so it's a, it's a harder read. Um, it's for, for people who really want to drill down into it. If you're, if you're starting to read them, start with You Are What You Love, uh, and, and that will give you an easy way into it. He follows 
Merleau-Ponty and Bourdieu and trying to drill down into the ways that we get a feel, and this is the language he uses, we get a feel for how we are meant to behave in the world. So a lot of this is not that we have very clear, well-formed ideas. We pick stuff up as we go along. We get a kind of feel for this is how we should behave. Um, so this is why we might learn to follow one set of rules at work, another at the hockey arena, and another in church. We were talking about this a bit this morning, about why men in particular might have one set of rules for how they express themselves emotionally at the hockey arena, and another one in church, such that you might not even think it was the same person sometimes. Um, but they have been formed and primed, and they understand that completely. Without, they, they, they maybe have not never thought about that consciously. Um, uh, and, and there would be dress codes at work, etc., uh, between those different spaces as well. It's also important to realize that he's not saying this is a bad thing. You know, this is how life works. This is how kids learn uh, to, to speak and to play and to think and to do stuff in the world. This is how human beings work in this kind of way. Um, it's how we learn to live. The difficulty comes, as Augustine would say, when we fall in love with the wrong things. And so for Augustine, his definition of sin was very powerfully bound up with loving the wrong things. And what Christians were meant to do was to learn to love what God loves. Do you know that old hymn? Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I would love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a very Augustinian idea of learning to love what God loves. Our disordered loves aim our lives at the wrong things. They drive us in the wrong direction. And so what we're looking for is ways in which our loves can be reordered. And the response to that comes in Christian worship and discipleship. And here's where Smith suggests that the counterformation, so if we've been deformed by our loving the wrong things, uh, then the reformation, our learning to love what God loves, that will aim our lives towards goodness and love, he says, well, this has to be liturgical in the same way that our other formation was liturgical. He doesn't mean that in a narrow church sense. He means it has to involve our whole selves. It has to involve our bodies. It has to involve our emotions. It has to involve our senses. So what happens to our bodies and our feelings in worship, because he thinks that worship is very key and central to this, although it's not all of it. What happens to our bodies in worship and to our feelings in worship really matters because it's part of our formation. Now, Smith, like Sam Wells, wants us to think about the core practices of common worship and how they shape us, in particular, baptism and the Lord's Supper, um, scripture reading and prayer. And he, he goes on in the final section of the book to talk a lot about those practices. I, I want to talk about two rather different examples um, uh, which have been important for me um, and which I think helped to open, up, op open these themes up maybe in a slightly different way um, than he's trying very hard to give the, the everyday examples. These are slightly less common examples, but I think uh, that they're interesting ones. So the first of them is the Ash Wednesday rite of the imposition of ashes. I vividly remember the first time I experienced this. It was a cold February in the late 1980s in St. Bride's Episcopal Church in Glasgow. And I wasn't quite sure why I was there as a low church evangelical Presbyterian, partly out of curiosity, I suppose. But the service turned out to be rather straightforward. An invitation to observe Lent. Well, that was kind of unfamiliar for me, but uh, there, was, there was nothing. It was basically scripture readings, prayers of confession, Prayer for grace to mark the season. And then came the moment. So I walked forward rather sheepishly. And for the first time in my life, I was in my mid-twenties. Someone told me in terms that I was going to die. You might say, well, didn't you know that? <laughs> but here's the thing. Even if that was a sarcastic question or a rhetorical question, I would be very tempted to say that, in fact, I'm not sure I did. I'm not sure that in a culture like our culture, which is death avoiding and death denying, I did know it in any meaningful way. People say the Victorians couldn't talk about sex and talked about death all the time. 
and uh, we can't talk about death and talk about sex all the time. So I'm not sure I knew it until, as Jamie might say to us, my body knew it. It was a profoundly moving and shocking experience for me and one that has never left me. And so subsequently, we practiced the ritual in the late, late service. And then in the Reformed Church, I was pastor of in London. And since then, in the Church of Scotland in Glasgow. And each year, it has been meaningful for me in new ways. The year my son was born, my colleague Chris, anxious to be inclusive, offered to ash the baby, and Rachel snatched him away. <laughs> the year my dear friend Ali died in Holy Week. We already knew for sure on Ash Wednesday that she only had a few weeks to live. The year after, when my friend Mark only had months to live. And three years ago in Glasgow, a minister I knew just a little who had terminal cancer showed up to our service with her daughter and both of them wept all the way through the service. I don't know why she said, I just had to come. For her, it was part of her body teaching itself that it was nearing the end. Let me give you another example. The imposition of ashes is an ancient ritual within the life of the church. This is a much more recent one. The service of prayer for healing from the Iona community was a service first developed as part of the cycle of weekly worship in Iona Abbey on the island of Iona off the west coast of Scotland. Start rowing off the coast of Nova Scotia and you'll hit it after, <laughs> after a few hours. Um, and as the com uh, there's a commercial in the UK that says, uh, does what it says on the tin. Well, this does what it says in the tin. It's a service of prayer for healing. Uh, people gather, they sing. Uh, John Bell and Graham Mall of the Iona community have written a number of songs for use in this service. They read a passage of scripture, usually a story from the Gospels about Jesus healing someone. It's a little theological preamble an explanation of what we believe and expect, that God can and does heal, that healing takes different forms, that often people are not cured, that sometimes healing will come through death. Laying on of hands is an ancient sign of love and prayer for the spirit to come upon people. No one there is claiming to be a healer or have special powers. This is a service in which the church gathers in prayer for God to work and act. A circle of cushions is placed on the floor and two people, often one man and one woman, go and stand in the center of the circle. The congregation is invited to gather round. Anyone who wishes can come forward to receive prayer and the laying on of hands. Most come and kneel. You'll see where they kneel. Some stand. Some may use wheelchairs or other chairs. And one by one, those in the center gather and place their hands on the head or the shoulder of the person kneeling. Others gathered around them on the outside may form a chain of connection, placing a hand on a shoulder or arm. And then everyone prays these words together. Spirit of the living God, present with us now, enter you, body, mind, and spirit, and heal you of all that harms you. In Jesus' name, amen. If there is a big congregation, it can take a while. The circle fills up and it empties and it fills again. The prayer is repeated for every individual. When everyone has been prayed for though, there is still one more thing to be done. The two individuals in the center who are usually not clergy, kneel down in turn and led by their partner, we all pray for them and lay hands on them using the same words as before. And then we are finished. I first took part in that ritual in the early 1980s in a tent in a field at Greenbelt Festival, flickering candles, and Graham Mall, key figure in Iona and Wild Goose work for four decades, laid hands on me aged 19, and then at the end, we all laid hands on him and prayed for him. We used it in the late, late service in my church in London, again, the church I served in Glasgow. I could rehearse the same things. We prayed those words over friends who did not get cured. And then Graham, who'd written so many of the songs along with John for healing, and who'd done the first, been, been, had laid hands on me in the first ritual, very sadly died 
on the 29th of December last year, aged only 61 after a brief and intense illness. I led the graveside committal at the close of his funeral service, and he told friends that he would not be cured, but he believed that he would be healed. And so at the graveside, knowing that he had taken part in this ritual and led it for some 30 years, I said these words before the burial. Today we affirm this. The spirit of the living God, who is present with us now, has entered Graham body, mind and spirit and has healed him of all that harms him. I think this Iona service is close to being a pitch-perfect ritual. It seems to me to be a perfect embodiment of Henry Nguyen's understanding of the theology of being a wounded healer. It's gentle but strong. It's open but humble. It's a liturgy for the body, both the body of Christ and the individual bodies. And it gathers the church into a shape that shows us through our bodies what it means to be the church as a healing community and how it feels to behave like the church. It would be an interesting exercise to compare it to a healing service in a Pentecostal church. I think there would be many overlaps, in fact, and both those and the differences would be interesting. One difference might be how emotion is managed and expressed and how that is related to the work of the Holy Spirit. And actually starting with this ritual might be interesting to go back and use as a way of reading the practice in a rather different kind of service. The third thing I want to talk about and the last thing uh, is going to be much briefer. I want to talk a little bit about emotional awareness in sermon preparation. And I want to consider how before we get to preaching a sermon, emotional awareness can be a factor in how we prepare. This harks back to what I was saying last night about the role of feelings and emotion in biblical interpretation. And I want to share with you in particular uh, the work of Anna Carter Florence and a recent book of hers, Rehearsing Scripture. <clears throat> Anna has a background in drama and she's drawn on that in the way in which she teaches her preaching classes. So here are some of the ideas she presents in the book. Um, these are ideas which she's worked on a lot in seminary settings. Um, the first thing is that this is mainly group work, which is interesting. So she gathers people to read biblical texts together and groups of people who are preachers or want to be preachers. Um, she gets people to think very often about scripture as a script and the act of preparation as a kind of rehearsal. And then the first thing that they do is, well, there's a process of casting. So they work out who's going to voice which parts of the scripture. And they go through the process of reading aloud and voicing the text. And then if there is movement going on within what they're reading, well, they block it out, as they say in the theater. They say, well, who's going to stand here and who's going to stand there? And how are you going to interact as you say this? One of her techniques in terms of reading the scripture is what she calls working the verbs. Um, and Stuart uh, was at a famous uh, workshop she did with us in Glasgow um, where she did this extraordinary exercise in working uh, the verbs. So simply uh, going through a passage and taking verb after verb. So it's exposition and exegesis, but it's an unusual way to do it. And, and one of the questions she'll see is who gets which verbs? And when you read the book and you hear her opening up certain stories, including uh, most powerfully, I think, David and Bathsheba. Sometimes she gets people to swap roles. So she'll get old people to play the parts of younger people. She'll get women to voice the parts of men and vice versa as a way of trying to get people to understand what's going on. How do you think it feels to be this person in the text? But the interesting thing that I think about this, and she would come from a, probably a more liberal theological perspective than I would. Um, um, uh, one of my um, uh, pet concerns, and, and Stuart and I are one in this, is that you have to stay with a text even if it's a difficult text, and you have to wrestle with it. I like the image of Jacob wrestling with the angel, where he says, I won't let go until you bless me. And I often use that. Um, 
that, that rather than body swerving it or deciding, instead of reading this difficult part of the text, there's a really nice couple of verses from Ephesians that I'm going to drop in at this point in this in the sermon. Um, you get really marked down in my preaching class for doing that. You know, you have to stay with the text and you have to read what's in front of you. And I sometimes say to people, you know, those really difficult verses that we don't know what to do with. The people heard them being read, you know. Uh, and they want to know what you're going to do with them. And if you're taking scripture seriously, and sometimes these are the people who, in theory, their theology means that they've got the highest view of scripture, uh, but they struggle to actually stay with the text and read it for all it's worth. And what Anna says, and this is a, is a, is a thing, I think, which comes from theater studies and drama theory, and some of you may know, know this, she says, you have to stay in the scene. So she says, you're not allowed to leave it, even if you don't like, even if you disagree even if you don't like what's going on, you have to stay in the scene and try and work out how you're going to perform some kind of version of this and do this. Um, now, um, there are lots of reasons why I, I, I like this approach, because I think it does what we've been talking about. It gets your body and your voice involved in trying to work out how to read a text and understand a text. So in that sense, it's, it's part of what we've been thinking about uh, last night and uh, tonight. Um, and... Um, It's interesting that it's actually quite difficult to do this by yourself, so it doesn't transfer very well to a preacher's study. And one option I did think about, uh, about this week might be to work with godly play figures, which I've pictured at the bottom, which some of you all know about. Um, Sam Wells, interestingly, worked for years in a low-income housing area and used to use godly play for his sermon every single week. And he's no mean theologian. Um, but what Anna's method does and what godly play does to a degree, it makes you ask questions about who's there, where are they standing? How are the bodies arranged in relation to one another? It makes you listen for voices, consider accents, social power. It makes you question the assumptions you make a about a text. I think it makes you aware of how things feel and how things look. So I want to draw a conclusion in a couple of sentences. Uh, um, this lecture has made the case for intentionally taking responsibility for the shape and the feel and the flow of worship. It's noted Samuel's insight about scripture training us in the skill of naming the presence of God and cited Derek Poole's question about how to name God in any particular context. I want to also um, claim here Tom Long's other insight about the importance of taking a cue from the form of scripture in relation to the form of the sermon. But perhaps even more than that, taking a cue also from the scripture that's in front of us about the mood of the sermon and of the service. So there will be some services when we have a lament in front of us, and maybe we need to lean into that and explore that within our worship in different ways. Take our cue from that and understand that on this Sunday, on this day, uh, we are being trained in the skill of naming the presence of God in the face of suffering. I don't think that happens often enough in our churches. But if we do that, and if we're following some kind of balanced diet of Scripture, there will also be a morning when you have Psalm 148 in front of you, and you have to summon everything in you and everything in the whole created uh, universe to praise God without reservation. Uh, and you will then have to think about the mood of the service in relation to that, and then many other options in between. Let the form of the passage and the content of the passage guide you in terms of the mood and the culture and the shape of the service. And in doing that, be intentional and take responsibility for the emotional journey that we're on. And I think if we do that, that might lead us into a much richer emotional journey, one in which we're being trained in the skill of naming the presence of God and of feeling the presence of God, reflecting that in sermon and song, in prayer and ritual, in symbol and in sign. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for taking us on that journey. And uh, 
Yeah, just preach the text. Eh? And uh, so we, we, we have some opportunity for, for folks to explore this a little bit further through your own questions. If you have a question, please use the microphone because it allows other people who are watching online to pick that up. Nobody else has got up. I usually wait. Um, thank you, Doug. Lots, so many different things to think about. Um, I went off, actually, in my mind, and this is going to be a, probably a little disjointed, because uh, we recently have, from just the last few years, a partnership with an Indigenous um, theological school. Well, they're a school, but not a school. And so um, they teach their own theolog theology degrees. We award the degrees. Um, but it's given... Uh, it's given some of us a whole different take <laughs> um, on theology, on the practice of worship, um, a different way of seeing. Uh, and there's so many resonances with what you're saying tonight with some of that. Um, and, and I'm just kind of digging around in my brain to understand that. that in, I think it was 2018, a guy called Damien Costello, and sorry, this is probably a little bit more commentary than I would want it to be than question. But Damien Costello was talking about the conversion of uh, Black Elk, who was a Lakota man. And some people often have questioned his agency as an indigenous person. Did he know what he was doing when he got baptized? And so the comparison then is with um, ritual and indigenous ceremony. So do you, do you see where I'm going with this? So he suggested, and again, I don't pretend to be an expert. I was wondering if Danny was online tonight because he... Um, he would understand this better than me. Um, but in Lakota, ceremony is embodying a spiritual reality. And so there's something going on in the spirit world. Ceremony is a portrayal of that in the body, but it doesn't exhaust it of meaning. Instead, the process of discernment that follows ceremony is trying to figure out and live into um, that reality. And is, is it just me? Are there resonances there with what you're talking about? I wonder if that's part of the Celtic influence and so on. But the sense of, it's not so much, it, it's far more connected than Westerns tend to be uh, with creation, with the oneness of reality and so on, connected therefore with feeling. But this, mo this sense that it's not so much, well, what we love, then we ritualize. Um, and I know that's not what, that's much too simplistic for what you're saying, what many people are saying about it, but it's, it's so much, it's feeling, but so much more than that, because it is this spiritual reality, a different layer that gets embodied by what we recognize our ceremony is but a reflection um, of that. I just, is that, is that making any sense no, it's, whatsoever? It, it's making a lot of sense. And I think, I mean, there's, there's two things that, that come to mind. One is in terms of our understanding of how to read the Hebrew Bible and to understand the the cult and the worship of the temple and, and a number of other things in, in the Old Testament. So there's lots of areas in which looking at those practices and what was going on uh, uh, there, um, I, I think that they're, are, are going to take us into a different space than the one that, that lots of Western uh, low church Protestants have typically inhabited. Um, uh, the other thing, I was talking to, to Danny earlier today, and uh, we were talking at one point, he was, he was making a, a, a point about drumming and the use of drumming in ritual. Uh, and uh, we, were t we were thinking together about how um, for um, white colonial settlers, um, they had their own rituals uh, where drums were extraordinarily important, and they were often within the military. And so drums could be used either to mark emotion, they could be used uh, muffled for mourning, they could be used to beat a retreat, or they could used to be used to mobilize people to go forward into battle. And then for us Scots, we could use the bagpipes as a way of screaming, in a sense, at the enemy and, and getting people's blood up. And, and um, these were very, very deliberate mobilizations. Now, the problem is that we, that, that, in, that, that while all these things were going on within the practice of white Western people, 
um, they were pointing the finger at other people and going, uh, these people are primitive, you know, and these people are using drums to do things that we think are very unsound and very problematic. And yet when they looked at their own practice, and I suppose it goes back to what I was saying earlier on, um, that people didn't have the language and the theological skill to reflect on their own lives and their own behaviour. Um, so it's like I don't have an accent. Do you all have accents, which I realise <laughs> when I come, I, I come here. It's the way in which we're invisible to ourselves. And so learning to, under, to reflect on our own culture and our own behaviour and to read that and to think of all the ways. So, one, for example, you know, being able to, as I, say, I think I was saying earlier today as well, learning to read our own worship services and our own worship practice. And I think this is particularly a growing issue uh, and, and task in relation to Pentecostal worship and charismatic worship. And we need to develop much better reflective skills in relation to doing that, saying what's going on here and what's a healthy version of this and what's uh, not such a great version of this and how would we tell and the thing is, unless we begin to accept responsibility for the ways in which we are stirring up suitable affections and are honest and transparent about that, we can't even have the conversation. If I'm pretending it's not me, you know, let my flesh life melt away. And not, none of me, I have no responsibility for anyone, for, for, for any of this. So I think we need to change the conversation. Um, and and uh, that will be... Um, uh, I think that's, that, that's extremely important. So, I mean, I'm... I'm I, I would have to do a lot of listening and learning in the particular area that you've talked about because it's not something I'm, I'm very familiar with. But I just had that conversation earlier today when we noted that one set of examples. Um, uh, and you think, you know, really? You don't see the, the... People don't see the connections between those kinds of behaviour and the ways in which they were working in people's uh, feeling lives. I'm probably the token Anglican in the room, so um, thank oh oh yay okay good. <laughs> thank you for um, well just the whole lecture. I spent some time um, three months on sabbatical focusing on liturgy and reading about liturgy and experiencing liturgy uh, and reflecting particularly about the the impact of liturgy, how it can transform us to live as Christians in the world. And so I read Sam Wells and I, I was amazing and I wanted to go to St. Mark's in the field. Um, I just wanted to direct people because sometimes it's thinking about how do you do this. Um, Sam Wells also has another book called Liturgy on the Edge and I don't know if you've read it or know it, but he actually talks about how they've developed liturgies often in, um, in dialogue with social agencies and groups that deal with homelessness, um, uh, people who've been murdered, uh, how they welcome people into their church who don't necessarily have any church background, but who can benefit from the ritual um, and the sacraments that the church has to offer them, and who can also bring something of their humanity and um, the kind of openness maybe that they can offer that's a little bit different. Um, and so it kind of pushes the church to really reflect uh, carefully about its language and the way it uses ritual and, and um, participation. Yeah. So it actually gives examples of liturgies and it shows them kind of laid out uh, the structure. Um, sometimes it offers kind of what the sermon or reflection was. So I just, that that is because it's so specific in those circumstances, each, each one that it talks about, um, it's a very good way to, if you're trying to sort of think about what you're saying and how to put that into action, um, it's a good way to look at that, um, but it kind of draws me to that whole question because you know we're here talking about this and and thinking about this in relation to people who maybe are not connected to the church. How how you relate some of what you're talking about? Because I mean, I was listening to all of this, thinking about this as somebody who's engaged in the life of the church and thinking about the people who were there. I mean, one of the challenges I had coming back from sabbatical was saying, you know, this is fine for us. <laughs> This, what we do is, doesn't connect. Um, some of it doesn't really connect because the language isn't familiar, the rituals aren't familiar, the theology isn't familiar, the symbols aren't familiar. How do you start to go beyond just who's with you now to how to relate to the world outside that has, because that's what you're talking about, but it's how to bring those together um, is kind of challenging for me. I'm still trying to figure out how you do what you do on a Sunday or whenever, um, and continue to do all the things you need to do because that's what 
give shape and um, life to the people who are with you in your congregation, but also recognizing that the future probably isn't there and how you do both and, right? You know, yeah. it's, it's not replacing one with the other. And again, you've talked about some of this, but to kind of maybe reflect a little more on, on how you move yeah. into those spaces. So anyway, that's a, like I said, that's a lot of commentary, and, but, a, but a question in terms of how to help us move out um, there yeah. and balance all of that, I don't no, know. No, that's, really, yeah. that's really helpful, and um, thank, you, thank you for that. And I, I'm still wondering about that too. <clears throat> I'm gonna see a little bit about, about it in the final lecture. Um, and, and thanks for pointing us to the other book of Sam's. I think he's a really creative and interesting and thinker. I mean, the the other thing I want to say as well is Casey Enby thinks, oh, you know, uh, Doug's trying to make us all become high church Anglicans. Um, uh, that's not what's in my head at all, or I own a community people. That's not what's in my mind at all. Um, uh, I've chosen the examples I've chosen tonight partly because I think uh, they might be very useful for helping us then to think about our own practice. You know, and, and I think what, what what my goal is is I, I I'm not trying to 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 say that I want everything in the church's practice to look the same. It's to say that actually our bodies are always there in worship. So the and actually there's always an environment in worship, um, and there is always uh, there are things that are ritual like in worship. There is I say to students that there always is a kind of liturgy. Uh, it's just not always written down, uh, and so. It's about, you know, my goal as an educator is to try and, 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 and as somebody who's involved in training ministers, I want them, you know, and some of them are very different. Some of them are liberal radicals and some of them are uh, conservative evangelicals and some of them are charismatic conservative evangelicals. And, you know, people are very different and their practice is going to be very different. The key thing, I think, uh, that we're concerned about is can you reflect theologically on your own practice and do you have the skills to do that? Um, and and uh, ca and can you reflect? Can, can you understand what other people are doing, even even if it's not what you want to do? Um, uh, and I think that's really that's really important. Um, and uh, and so, in case MD was thinking, oh, this all sounds very off-putting to me. Uh, all this talk about 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 ritual and liturgy. Um, I, I I was talking to someone last week. Um, who a Pentecostal who's teaching in Belfast, who was talking about um, uh, experiences of, of people being healed uh, in intensely emotional worship times in the Pentecostal church she attends. And, uh, uh, but what, she's just written a PhD and that's part of her final chapter. And that's what I think is exciting is that people are beginning to do work and reflect on that kind of context and situation and, and everything in between those as well. Um, Okay, while folk are getting up, Doug, just clarify for me. So you are saying to each of us who lead worship and preach, we just have to admit it, we are dealing with feelings. That's and, and, really, oh, is that going to be your question? Be, actually, yes. I'll let you follow in on that then. So I'm, I'm just clarifying that because I, I'm, I'm a little surprised there's not pushback in that because that is precisely what often we're given into trouble for. You're playing in people's emotions. Uh, but I, I'm saying this is someone who agrees with you on this, uh, that the reality is we start by saying we are dealing with feeling and emotion. That is actually quite a big claim, I, I think, if I'm understanding correctly. So when Andrew stands up to lead in church tomorrow, he's dealing with feeling. Yeah? OK. I want to come back as to what are suitable ones. But nevertheless, Clarence, I'll let you. Well, it's, it's tied into what you're just speaking about, because I, I come wanting to hear more about the impact of what emotions and feelings can have in our culture today, especially as institutional churches, because I think the church being a body of believers is different than the institution. So what I'm still struck by and, and searching for is what do you believe the impact is on bringing this message um, because you talked about it being in other disciplines, um, what is that, what are the implications or the potential positive impact that focusing on um, emotions and feelings more intentionally 
because as Stuart alluded to, I think it's been pushed aside and we have to be logical and rational about what we say and do. And, and when you talked about reflection, I think it's very easy for people to, again to slip into how did it go, not did what did it create. And so it's, I was curious about the bigger picture. Where is this going in terms of this research, specifically in this area of theology? Well, I mean, I think it's a, I, I, last night I tried to lay out some of what I thought was <clears throat> a bit of a research agenda, and some people are, you know, Joy, who I just mentioned, is is, is doing this already. But um, I mean, part of the answer is is I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things I'm discovering, and 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 also this is, uh, and as, as Jamie makes very clear, this is not about trying to diminish. I mean, he's a philosopher. He, you know, he's. It's not about diminishing the idea of you know, the the importance of ideas and of books and of reading and of learning and of, uh, and of the cognitive. But what I'm finding is that um, I think we didn't ask questions and have conversations about feelings and emotions well within the church. And we've already last night and, and today, I think, said, well, people would say, oh, well, feelings are fickle. Don't trust your feelings. We, there was various things we would say about them, but it was quite a superficial conversation very often. And uh, what happens is when you start and say, let's have a really serious conversation about emotions and about feelings, turns out that's quite a difficult thing to do. And so I, th I think we're, we're, we're sort of pushing into this and maybe we're still in the early stages of, of being able to do it. Um, but this idea of taking responsibility for what we're doing intentionally. And then what we have to do is try and work out, well, how do we describe our own action and the action of the Holy Spirit, and how do we put those things together? Because this is not about displacing the Holy Spirit, but it's about saying uh, that those, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't, uh, doesn't kind of efface our humanity. Uh, the Holy Spirit works through our humanity. Um, and uh, so understanding that, and also the Holy Spirit works through us as people who, are, who have a culture uh, and uh, an identity um, and um, uh, and, and in a sense, God graciously comes and works through our particularity, and that's part of this, the, the theology of the incarnation, but it's also the story of how the Holy Spirit works, in a sense, I don't know, concursively, or, or you know, the, the things work together and flow together in us. But even that's quite a hard thing to, to explain and understand and talk about. So I don't know if I can give a very good answer to the question. I, I think I'm saying, you know, uh, that, that, that we need to talk more about this and think more about it. And I still feel that I'm early in the journey of doing this as well. Um, <clears throat> with all, the, uh, thank you for everything you've been saying this evening. I've got sparks going all over the place, but um, some of us here uh, attended the um, midwinter feast that the indigenous students here, the university invited us to just before this. And uh, I was thinking, as Anna was speaking and uh, you were sharing, they brought their ritual to the feast in the middle of Wheelock Hall with all the students there. So some people were from the community, some were students, some. And uh, Lorraine Johnson brought a prayer. And uh, there, the um, uh, honor song was sung with the drum. Um, and so they brought the, the drum and the ritual. And I thought, wow, what a sacred sharing in this busy, full Wheelock Hall with unsuspecting students, plus, plus us who were invited from the community, plus the indigenous pe people just made it happen in this incredible full dining room, just brought the ritual. And everyone stood and respected and listened. And it was very, very moving. It was very special. And, um, it's a sharing journey, this truth and reconciliation and understanding these cultures and respect and what we can learn from one another. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting to have that experience and then just hearing some of the things we're talking about tonight. And, and, and thanks, for, thanks for saying that. And, and I think that um, these kind of conversations, intercultural conversations, and, and to some extent when they're becoming into religious conversations as well, are going to be complicated conversations sometimes. And, uh, and, and there, there are no, probably no inter-religious conversations where people end up completely saying, well, we think exactly the same thing or, or believe exactly the same things. 
But one of the things that I think is interesting is, is that if for, for people who are coming from a kind of traditional um, uh, Western Protestant form of Christianity um, uh, and, and a Eurocentric version of that, um, if we can't reflect on our own practice thoughtfully and understand what we're doing, actually we're not even ready to come to the table and have a conversation with other people about, about, about uh, their practice. And yet so often what happens is the opposite of that, is that people rush to find the thing that they're suspicious of and they disagree. Uh, and, 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 you know, so it's, it's, you know, I think that's a really important thing that uh, I think respect, I think listening, the things you mentioned, I think hospitality, those things are really important. Uh, and also, you know, developing enough of an understanding of, of what we're doing ourselves, um, uh, which I don't think we have yet. And, and, and some of the feeling questions um, are, are going to be ways to help us to reflect on that, as are, you know, what's our own ritual practice? Uh, how do we use the senses in our worship? Uh, and various kinds of questions like that. Yeah. Oh, hello, Frank. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I want to come back to uh, the place where I'll be on Sunday. And um, uh, I see the hard work of putting yourself in the position of being an agitator uh, in this experience. Uh, so I'm going to bring something absolutely new to a group of people who have not given any opportunity to think about you know, what does it mean to have the uh, Ash Wednesday experience? Or what does it mean to have the foot washing experience when you are um, on Monday, Thursday? Or um, when what they are used to is uh, three songs, a prayer, picking up the offering, hearing the scripture, someone screaming at them for 30 minutes, and, and, and then ask to respond to some kind of spiritual experience that will allow them to go out into the world um, thinking about change of some sort. Uh, what you're asking me to do in this experience, and I appreciate you asking me, is to create an environment which will not last the uh, 60 minutes of this ritual they've been used to, but you're asking me to create for them something I experienced in India sometime. Three hours of standing while well, all they did was take up the offering and then explain to me um, that um, this was for the 400 churches that they are planting somewhere else in the country and they have to now go and pay the bills so that the building can still exist, which w really moved me. So, so I I'm just wondering, you know, what is the process by which I connect with my feelings in this journey so that I gain the courage to move this very staid congregation I serve into something that would create a revolution. It might even cost me my, my job. <laughs> um, um, that's a great, a great comment. Um, I was talking to somebody who said they were, they'd been training as a mediator. I don't know if they're here tonight, but um, uh, and, and uh, so often when uh, we've got a really interesting project back in the Church of Scotland called The Place for Hope, which has been training mediators because we have such a recurring problem with internal conflicts within congregation and with, with, with managing change in particular, with issues around buildings, changing buildings. These pews are going to be removed from the church over my dead body, and other people going, that can be arranged. <laughs> um, uh, but, but that actually, I, I think, uh, you know, starting to, the, what seems to be absolutely a constant is that wherever you work with situations where change is very difficult, uh, if you don't begin to address how people feel and ask them how they feel, and to work with that, um, uh, then you're going to find change very difficult because um, you know, so often what happens is that, that you find that that was the pew that my grandmother sat in or whatever, and that's why I don't want it uh, taken out of the church or, or whatever. And people have these deep 
emotional connections, uh, and and so change can be very very threatening to them. So I think, you know, it feels like actually it's very important for for thinking about changing the church, and 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 also but also to begin with these people and to really value and respect their emotions, um, and and um, uh, to. Um, but also, I think, when it comes to what we're going to talk about in the final lecture a bit, is when we try and think about uh, a point you made about, about emotional connections with people outside of the church. Um, uh, I mean, towards the end of our life, my great, great aunt uh, was very reluctant to buy anything new for her house. And she used to say in her uh, broad uh, uh, southwest of Scotland accent, it'll see me out, uh, which... Um, now, the problem is that that attitude in church, where, where there are some things that will see some people out, but they're not going to see new people in. Um, and that's where we have to have a difficult conversation, because we have to say, the church can't just be, um, it'll see me out. Uh, we have to find ways to, to make new, new connections and, and new, new ways in for people. Um, uh, and... Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the final lecture. I'm going to kind of draw this to the close. Uh, we could have talked all night. I have questions and things that would be fascinating to follow through, but we still have quite a full day tomorrow. And Doug, you have a full day tomorrow in that you will be preaching at chapel. So the ADC chapel service will be in Manning Chapel tomorrow, beginning at 11.30, to which you're all invited. That will be followed by a community lunch. Then in the afternoon, uh, Doug is doing a slightly off the main theme, but no doubt will have many connections because it's all coming through his body and these things are connected in there. Uh, that he'll be doing something on uh, God, Scotland and the politics of nationalism. And uh, we're going to be joined in that by a panel, in including a professor from... Uh, the politics department, so we'll explore that theme. And then in the evening, we'll have the final one of these lectures. I'm just reminding you of the things you're doing in case you're missing what I'm saying to you. And of course, you don't have an accent. So, uh, so we're going to call a halt to it just now. Uh, again, Doug, I want to thank you tonight for taking us on this journey. I, I think our encouraging us to acknowledge the place of feeling as a significant part of shaping the preparation of worship and indeed of preaching is, is quite a significant move. And I, I, I appreciate that very much. So let's thank Doug for what he's brought again. Uh, but to conclude, because of your commitment, would you come and stand and Go and be a priest and say the grace for us. Yeah? Okay. Shall we stand if we're able? I'll say a line and then you say it back to me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God. And the, love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us all. Be with us all. Amen.